am non-heretic, nay ye shall pray for me. You are like the loathsome bears who destroy the beautiful blossoms of the pear tree by greedily devouring the blossoms until the tree is bare, only to turn round and defecate foul, stinking piles in place of the blossoms. Bathe in his governments, leak on to the lovely bear. Do destroyest and devourest the flowers and blomes of virtuous living to the endless damnation. And many manis in Dringa, lesser than do have a grasa of repentance and amending. Did you get all of that? Need I repeat any of it? You must understand that I, Marjorie Kemp, am such a pitiful, wretched creature that I would never dare speak to such an illustrious gathering of clergymen so. But our Lord Jesus Christ gave me courage, emboldened my soul, and spoke through me. It was he, not I, who scolded the priests. I'm such a simple creature. I could never have defended myself without Christ to guide me. So there I stood, before the Archbishop of York himself, Henry Bowett, that worldly, fat living prelate who so zealously tried and persecuted the Lollards. God gave me the courage to stand up to him and those who had accused me of heresy and had dragged me like a dog in chains before him. God spoke such good words to my soul and to my mouth that not even Archbishop Bowett could find fault with them. He declared what I had said was a good tale. He could find no fault with me. And so he released me, for there was no fault that the Archbishop could find with me. And when I was born, my certain it must have been sometime around the year of our Lord, 1373, perhaps? The Crown and Church of England were churning in turmoil. I paid no attention to such things. Had I known, I might have been better able to handle the, the, the warnings that Christ had given me of how greatly I was to suffer for love of him. abandoned 
God and the Holy Church. I spoke such wicked and cruel words, slandering my friends, my husband, even myself. I was so out of my mind that I even ripped and tore at my own flesh so that I had to be taken from my house to a building where I was forcibly restrained. Finally, our merciful Lord God, blessed may he be, pity on this wretched creature. Half a year, eight weeks, and a few odd days later, as I lay there in my restraints, our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me. He looked on me with such a loving face that I instantly felt my soul strengthened as he said, Daughter, why have you forsaken me when I've never forsaken you? As he spoke, the whole, the whole room opened up and was lit as if by lightning. I watched him rise into the air until the room closed in around me once more. All at once I was returned to my senses. I had been saved by the mercy, grace, and love of our God. Ever the ungrateful creature, I continued to pursue worldly goods. I did not embrace the hard work, penance, and ascetic discipline required for such <coughs> mystical experiences. pursued worldly things instead of a strong, intimate, and affectionate devotion to the person and humanity of Christ. And it would require the intervention of God himself again to bring me to my senses. He cast down my pride, and when I was at my lowest, he came to me once more and said, Daughter, why do you weep so bitterly? It is I myself that have come to you. Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, suffering cruel and bitter pains and torment for you. I, the very same God, forgive you of all your sins down to the smallest one. Therefore, I bid you and command you to boldly call me Jesus, your love. For I am your love shall be this love without end. My life was to change. Lord Christ Jesu, ye thank thee for all poverty, for all sickness, and all scornies, for all speeches and all wrongness. And for all diverse tribulations that had fallen here, may have fallen on me as long as you shall live. Amy, he thank they that the world is left in me, suffering any in this world in remission of me sinnies, and more of me merit in heaven as we see, as ye have great cause to thank they. He may refill thinking in me heart and speaking it with me mouth at this time in worship of eternity and of all the courts of heaven and all in 
contemplation and high contemplation were wonderful, intimate and spiritual conversations that he had with me in my soul, teaching me that I would be despised because of his love for me, and that I should be patient, furthermore, contempt, shame, and insults I suffered in the world. The more I would rise in the eyes of God. My endurance would win my eternal life. As my devotion grew, so too did my weeping. Once, as I, I visited the cathedral at Canterbury, I had such contemplations that I wailed and moaned so loudly that when I left, of people gathered around me, insulting and mocking me. They called me a false liar. They thought I could summon the tears at will. They did not understand that it was God himself who made me weep so bitterly, and that it was he who called the tears forth. They had so much contempt for me. So much contempt that my own husband went back inside the cathedral and pretended he didn't know me. Christ had warned me that such would be my treatment. So as the mob gathered round, hurling the rebukes and insults, I turned to them and said, when he was at home in the own country, day by day, with great weeping and mourning, he sorrowed, for he had no shame scorn and despite as ye were worthy. Ye thank you, our Sarahs, hailly, what forenoon and afternoon ye have had reason to be this day. As my contemplations grew, so too did my longing to see all of the holy places that our Lord Jesus Christ himself had visited. And so in 1413, with my husband's permission and the dispensation of the Bishop of Lincoln, I departed for the Holy Land. My pilgrimage would take the greater part of 18 months, for I would return through Rome and tarry there for some time. It was in Rome that I would begin to wear the white of a novice nun, as Christ himself had commanded me to do. Shortly after I had left England for the Holy Land, 1414, I have since learned, the Lollards had plotted to murder His Majesty King Henry V. Oh, by the grace of God, blessed may he be. The king was warned of their plot and was able to thwart their plans. Though the Lollard leader, Lord Calbum, escaped. His Majesty became so concerned with the declining state of the church that he decided to take the enforcement of orthodoxy into his own royal hands. And when I returned to England from the Holy Land just over a year later, I was more hated than ever. People thought my novice's clothing peculiar and hypocritical. For I had 14 children, and my husband was still living. My weeping had grown louder and more frequent than ever. And I could not hold my tongue now any more than I could before. I cared not what station the man held. If he had offended God, I was compelled to tell him so. So as the people's hatred of me grew, so too did their accusations of heresy. <clears throat> but I lived closer to God. The closer I grew to him, the more sensitive I became to anything that might displease him. I could not abide coarse language. And I could not stand idly by if I knew that one's salvation was in peril. So it was with one monk. He did not believe that God spoke directly to my soul. And so he asked me if he would be saved. I told him that I understood he had sinned in lechery, in despair, and in hoarding worldly goods. He stood stock still. He was so surprised that God had revealed his sins to me. Yet he tested me further by asking me, had he 
Jackson with single or married women. It had been with married women. Understand that God spoke directly to my soul. He asked me in earnest if he would be saved. I told him that he would if he did as I said. Sorrowing for me, sin. And he shall help you to sorrow me. Bet shriven thereof and forsaking it willfully. Leveth the office that ye have without and forth, and God shall give you grace for me, love. He understood that these were God's words, not mine. So he ceased his sinning and gave up his office outside of the church. But the people did not see my <coughs> admonishment of religious men as a sign of my sanctity. To the contrary, they believed that by rebuking the clergy, I was behaving as John Wycliffe would have if he was still alive. And so they would constantly accuse me of lollardy. And so no sooner had Archbishop Lowett released me, I was arrested again by the Duke of Bedford, the very brother of our good King Henry V. The Duke declared that I was the greatest heretic and most dangerous lollard in all the land, and he sent me to trial. Who should sit in judgment over me? Poor Archbishop Lowett. When he saw I had been brought before him a second time, he exclaimed, what? Woman, are you here again? I'd rather be rid of you. The Archbishop declared, he examined me on the art Articles of Faith and found me perfectly orthodox. My accusers claimed that I was actually Lord Cobham's daughter, had been sneaking letters around the country, and that I had never been to Jerusalem or on any pilgrimage. The Archbishop knew they were scandalous lies, but it did not matter. <coughs> the Duke of Bedford was angry with me, and he was determined to have me. The Archbishop was in such a delicate position between crown and church, though he knew I was faithful to Holy Mother Church and innocent of the charges, so he could not in, in good faith meet out any punishment. He was determined to release me as he had before. So as he gave me his blessing to leave, defying the Duke of Bedford, he said, I believe there has never been a woman in the whole of England that has been treated as she has been.